The point is, we have to start focusing on the signals. The signals do this. Well, let me explain how this happens. When we look at a cell nucleus, this is where the chromosomes and the DNA is. I can stain the chromosomes, and you break open the nucleus, you can see all these different chromosomes. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes to make a human. They're called pairs of chromosomes because you get 23 chromosomes from your mother, 23 chromosomes from your father, and they're matched pairs. So, in fact, even I can see that one of these is from the mother and one of these is from the father because you can color code them. Well, that's a nice, interesting experiment, but the question is this. What am I staining? I'm not staining DNA. So what's in the nucleus? And the answer is this. 50% of the nucleus is DNA and 50% is protein. And the reason why we have a problem here is this. For 50 years, everyone was so focusing on the genes that when they wanted to study the DNA, what did they do? They'd go find a nucleus from the cell, they'd break it open, expose all the chromosomes, and you know what they do? Separate the protein from the DNA and then throw away the protein. And for 50 years, they've thrown away the protein in their focus on studying DNA. And now, all of a sudden, in the last few years, the question is, hey, what have we been throwing away? And the answer is the control. They, for 50 years, they've thrown the control away, what controls the genes, and studied pure DNA. There is no such thing as pure DNA in any organism. The DNA is always associated with the protein. So what's the function of the protein? Look how simple this is. The protein forms a sleeve around the DNA. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Imagine my bare arm is a gene. Let's say it's the gene for blue eyes. And I say, OK, can you read the gene for blue eyes, yes or no? Yes. yes. OK, but all of a sudden, well, what does the DNA look like when I put it back in the nucleus? Put the sleeve of protein on it. Can you read the gene for, for blue eyes, yes or no? If you want to read the gene for blue eyes, what do you have to do? Take the sleeve off. Well, the sleeve is protein. How does a sleeve come off? Here's the protein, and it's locked onto my arm. If you can remember back about 15 minutes ago, what is it that will cause the change in the shape of the protein? Ah, so when I add the signal from the environment, all of a sudden, then what happens is this. The protein changes shape, pulls away from the DNA. Now I can read the gene. And when the signal is removed, the protein will come back and cover up the sleeve again. So the bottom line was this. The gene was just sitting there all the time. It's whether the proteins are present or absent. So if I look at it this way, then we understand this. I said you were made out of protein. The understanding is that DNA is the blueprint for the protein. In conventional textbooks, because they've thrown away the protein for 50 years, they don't talk about this. Conventional talks about the DNA goes to the RNA, which is a, like a Xerox copy of the DNA, and the RNA is then turned into the protein. And then they talk about the primacy of DNA. That's what's in all the textbooks. You are a re result of your DNA. But they've thrown away the protein. So when we put it back in, it says, ah, the protein covers up the DNA. The protein is a sleeve. But to take the sleeve off, you actually have to have the environmental signal. So remember what Niehaus' quote was? A signal from the environment activates the expression of the DNA. So the bottom line right here is this. The environmental signal comes in and changes the shape of the regulatory protein, which removes the sleeve, exposes the DNA, and then I can make my proteins. So rather than the primacy of DNA, which is conventional thought, it's actually the primacy of the environment. It's the environment that selects your genes, not the genes themselves. So if I wanted to illustrate it, let's go back to our picture of how the cell worked. What I showed you was this. The signal from the environment activated the receptor, which activated the effector, and the effector activated the secondary signal to go down to the protein. Remember that picture just a minute ago? Well, here's the point. In this illustration, the protein's not there. And if I need the protein because the environmental signal, I have to respond to the signal and the protein's not there, what would I need to do if the protein's not present in the cell? Go to the nucleus and activate the gene for the making of the protein, right? So let's watch the behavior of this as it happens. So basically what's going to happen is this. The environmental signal joins to the receptor, activates this whole process so that I activate this. But look, the signal goes down, the proteins are missing. If the proteins are missing, I need the proteins to make the, the proper response, but they're not there. 
So what I have to do then is take this signal and go into the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is. But the DNA is covered up by a sleeve of protein. And at periodic points, at every gene, there's a control protein called a regulatory protein. And you know what happens? The signal from the environment binds to the right gene by the shape. It doesn't bind to this one, wrong shape. Binds to this one. Now, what happens when a signal binds to a protein? Changes the shape of the protein. And watch what happens. As soon as I change the shape of the protein, I cause the sleeve to come off the DNA. And when it happens, look what I'm exposing. The gene is now exposed. And what am I going to do with this? Well, I need to make a copy of the gene called RNA, which then goes into the cell where it's turned into the protein. So the bottom line is, then I take the RNA molecule, make a copy of this DNA molecule, and then this is a blueprint of the gene, and this is called RNA, messenger RNA, and this blueprint is actually used to make the protein. So what's the understanding about this whole process? It says this, the gene is not exposed until the signal calls it into play. When the signal is gone, the sleeve covers it up, and the gene is now hidden. If this is a cancer gene, and it's not giving you cancer because it's not exposed, what will cause the cancer gene to express itself? The signal. So all of a sudden it says, then what signals from your environment are you perceiving that you are selecting negative genes or processes in your body? And all of a sudden we start to say, so let's do the same thing now without all the labels, real fast. The secondary signal goes down, the protein's missing, the secondary signal goes into the nucleus, finds the right gene by binding to the right regulatory protein, causing the regulatory protein sleeve to come off, exposing the gene. And once the gene's exposed, I make a copy of it called RNA, and this is what goes out into the cell and is used for the function and behavior of the cell. So what is the conclusion of all of this? And the answer is simply this. Perception controls genes, understand? The genes did not control themselves. The perception was the signal that converted the, the sleeve of the, the DNA to come off. So the bottom line is perception not only controls behavior, but perception will actually go in and select which genes you're going to express. Now here comes the third part. The first part, perception controlled behavior because the protein was there. The second part, the signal shows up and the protein's not there, so the perception signal goes to the genes and activates the appropriate gene. Here's the third part. What happens if I run into a stressful environment and I don't have the appropriate genes to respond to that stress? Well, then you just have to say, well, the only way you're going to manage is to change the genes. Well, in conventional biology, the only way the genes change is a process called random mutation. This is in all the textbooks. What does it mean? It says this. I can chemically cause a mutation to occur, but what I can't control is the outcome. The outcome is always random. So the bottom line is that's where Darwinian belief comes in, that evolution was random changes in the genes, that genes are only changing by accident. That's conventional belief, except 1988, this paper comes out in Nature by a man called John Cairns, and it changes the entire foundation of biology that we've ever held for the following reason. He tells us about a new kind of mutation called an adaptive mutation. The point about this mutation, that the genes are not changing randomly, but the environment is controlling the mutation so that you're always adjusting your genes to fit what you see in the environment. And so that it's not random, it's environmentally directed mutations. Well, recently, this is a paper that just came out within the last year, the other one was 1988. This is a very interesting paper because what they showed was this. You can take a population of bacteria, put it into five test tubes, and put the same but very stressful environment into each of the test tubes, causing the bacteria to change their genes to survive. Here's the point. In each of the five test tubes, the result was exactly the same. Well, then all of a sudden it says, where's the random nature of that process? And the answer is, it's not random. Evolutionary changes are always adapting to the environment. These miniature adaptive radiations unfold in the same way every time governed by the available environmental niches. Here's the point. We adjust our genes to fit the environment that we think we live in. 
And I say we think we live in because perception may be right and perception may be wrong. And therefore, perception is belief. And if this is true, do you understand what this means? It's belief that changes your genes. It's your perception that changes your genes. It's not an accident. And so this chart out of science, which is about Cairns' work about genetic changing, uh, I, cha I, I marked this one with an asterisk because when this article came out, this box was called Genes of DNA Metabolism. There's now a new name for that. It's now, they're called genetic engineering genes. What this means is this. We have now found out that in every one of your cells, you have genes whose function it is to rewrite the other genes when necessary. So you are all equipped with an ability to adapt and change your genes as you respond to the environment. So all of a sudden it says this, the environment, watch where the arrow goes, the environmental signals activate genetic engineering genes. They can change your own genes and change your genotype. But this one, organisms' perception of the environment separate from the environment, why? Because perception and environment may be two different things. I might say, I live in a toxic, hostile environment. But that might be my belief. I might be in a very supportive environment. So it says, my perception may differ from the reality of the environment. But n nonetheless, what does perception do? Follow the blue arrow. Activates genetic engineering genes. Your own beliefs are selecting your genes. And if you don't have the right genes to handle the stress that you're in, your belief will rewrite your genes in an effort to do so. So all of a sudden it says, there's a lot of control over your life, but it's mediated by the perception of the environment. That's what's controlling the whole thing. So our third conclusion is, not only does the perception activate behavior, not only does the perception activate the genes, but when necessary, perception rewrites genes. So what's the conclusion? Are you genetically controlled? Are you at the behest of your uh, heredity? Are you a victim? Absolutely not. Why? Because by adjusting your perception, you can adjust your behavior. By adjusting your perception, you can select different genes in your function. By adjusting your perception, you can rewrite your genes. Now, I wouldn't want you to rewrite your genes because 95% of us got here with very appropriate genes to survive and have a great life. Here's the problem. Almost always, when you rewrite your genes, you do a negative process because your genes were already working. And so lots of illnesses and things like cancer, 95% of cancer has no hereditary linkage. 95% of cancer is actively produced by an individual's perception rewriting their normal genes and making cancer genes. All of a sudden, it's unfortunately, remember when I told you when you were a victim of your heredity, you could be irresponsible because the genes just came that way. If you understand what I'm talking about, then all of a sudden you say, oh my goodness, then how I see things, how I believe things are going on become important. The answer is, huh, well, if you think your behavior or the selection of your genes or the rewriting of your genes is important, then the answer is yes, because all of these are connected to belief, because perception in humans is related to belief. So you have the ability to change anything in your body. Unfortunately, if you got here healthy and you change it, that usually means you're making it less uh, uh, effective as a living organism. So the bottom line is this, the perception of the environment, your nervous system sees the environment and interprets it. So here's the real environment, here are the cells. Interestingly enough, if I would take dystrophic patients and take muscle cells out of their body, in many cases when I took the cells out of the body and put it into a good environment, the cells grew beautifully and, and grew healthy and well. But when they were in the body, they didn't. Why? Because somewhere between the environment and the cell, the perception got involved with it. So our beliefs are altering our biology at every moment, at every time, okay? So the question is, what kind of beliefs and genes am I affecting? Here's this beautiful but very important, simple understanding. The genes in your cell are the equivalent of programs in a disk, in a computer, okay? And the bottom line about it is this, what kind of programs then are in your body? And the answer is simply this, there are two classes of programs. One class is for growth and reproduction, which is a form of growth, and the other is for protection. So that the bottom line is this, when you walk into the environment, you're either gonna select growth programs 
or you're going to select protection programs. And I'm going to explain why it's an either or. I'll give you a simple understanding. I put a, a cell in a petri dish. And in one petri dish, I put nutrients here in front of the cell. In a, another petri dish, I put toxins in front of the cell. And then I wait for a period of time. What's going to happen? The answer is this. Cells always move toward signals, nutrients or whatever, positive signals, because positive signals encourage growth. On the other hand, when a cell was confronted with a toxin, toxins threaten survival. So what does a cell do? It doesn't move to the toxin. What does it do? It moves away. And therefore, cells always move away from negative signals. Why is that important? If I'm a cell and there's toxins, there's food here, I'm going to move this way. If I'm a cell and there's toxins, I'm going to move this way. Can a cell move forwards and backwards at the same time? And the answer is no. Why is that relevant? And the answer is simply this. When confronted with an environmental signal, the cells have to make a decision to be in growth or to be in protection. Why is that relevant? Because when the cell is in protection, it stops growing. And the more protection we think we need, the more we shut off our growth mechanisms. And therefore, we start stymieing our own health. Let me give you an example. Cells move toward positive signals as a mode of growth. Cells move away from negative signals as a means of protection. There are some signals that the cell doesn't even care about because it doesn't bother its growth or its protection. So there's some signals the cell doesn't really care, so there's zero. So the bottom line is this. Cells are either moving in growth or cells are moving in protection, but they can't do both at the same time. That's an individual cell. But I said you were made out of 50 to 75 trillion cells. So when I look at a human, I have a graded scale. You are either in some degree of growth or you're in some degree of protection based on the signals.